Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guests today are Matt Zwolinski and Miranda perry Fleischer authors of Universal Basic Income, What Everyone Needs to Know. It's published by the Oxford University Press, and it was released on the 11th of this month, just a couple of days ago. So Matt is the professor of philosophy and director of the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy at the University of San Diego. He's the editor of Arguing About Political Philosophy. He's also the author of The Individualists About Libertarianism, which I believe he is one, and another book, uh, Exploitation, dealing with philosophy and economics. And Miranda is a professor of finance also at San Diego. Her work also focuses on UBI, as well as charity, libertarianism, and uh, redistribution of wealth, especially as concerns uh, dynastic uh, wealth transfer, which I think my, my son's golf partners would probably take issue with, some of them anyway. Um, so anyway, how many of us have heard of UBI? A minority of readers probably, which is why this is a good book to read, uh, some familiar maybe through the candidacy of Andrew Yang, who I really liked, especially when he said he was hesitant to run for the presidency because he was not insane. Um, <laughs> but other than that, for most of us, it's one of those black boxes. And I always think of it this way because of my bookstore. If this bookstore is a title chosen for our nonfiction book club, there will no doubt be a sharp divergence of opinion over whether 350 million Americans get $1,000 a month from the government at a cost of $3 trillion thereabouts. And perhaps that's the best way to start this conversation. So welcome, Matt, and welcome, Miranda. Thank you. Okay. It's good to be here. So before we begin talking about it, I wanted to get an idea, which I always do, again, being a bookseller, after reading the title of the book, I'm going, OK, how are they going to approach this? And then when I began, and as I went through the book, I vacillated with regard to what you were attempting to tell the reader. First, I thought, is this a primer, a kind of dialectic deep dive into the pros and cons of a UBI? Or is it a persuasive argument for its adoption in one form or another? So if, before we get into it, what would you say would be those precepts and what you want the reader to take away? Well. I think our intention is for it to be a primer, but given that Matt and I are both supporters of a UBI, I think it's hard for there not to be a little hint of the advocacy in it. So Matt and I tried to be upfront about our normative priors in it, and I know Matt and I elsewhere have each written in favor of it. But what we would like readers to take away is just a fuller and more nuanced understanding of the pros and cons of a UBI so that when they're sitting around with their friends or their relatives having a debate about the merits of a UBI, they can make the best arguments possible. So we felt that a lot of pro-UBI books had some drawbacks. Some of the, a lot of the pro-UBI books, for example, don't recognize the cost or some of the complexities and downsides of it. Um, nor did they really talk about some of the implementation issues, which are, which are very real. And that's where I bring some of my expertise as a tax professor. Um, likewise, a lot of the critiques that you hear of a UBI, there aren't really big, long books critiquing UBI, but there are a lot of um, articles, both in the popular press and scholarly articles critiquing of it, sort of rely, some of them rely on evidentiary arguments that the evidence doesn't really support. So what we wanted was for people to get a good solid overview of the pros and the cons and the facts supporting or opposing UBI so that they could draw their own conclusion based on their own normative prior. Because really at the end of the day, how you feel about UBI is going to just turn down, uh, sort of boil down to how you feel about redistribution in general. Yeah, and, and so Matt, I, you know, first of all, you guys on the same page, uh, literally and figuratively, and don't most people have almost like in today's society where there's really no civil discourse anyway, don't most people just have like a knee jerk response to this thing? People have strong feelings about the UBI in, in both directions. Um, it really, 
<laughs> strong feelings. So when you talk to people who are supporters of the UBI, people who uh, maybe found out uh, like you did about the UBI from the candidacy of Andrew Yang, uh, a, a lot of them, in my experience, approach the topic of a UBI with almost a kind of religious fervor. Uh, I mean, it, the idea is that this UBI, it's not just this kind of technocratic policy shift that, you know, might marginally improve the status of the, the poor and marginalized in society. It's this transformative policy that's going to radically change the nature of capitalism and the family and crime and poverty and everything. Um, so on the one hand, you have you have people who are very, very passionately in support of UBI. And on the other hand, you have people who think it's basically, you know, one or 10 steps down the slippery slope towards uh, communist dictatorship uh, and that there's nothing uh, to be said in its defense. So like Miranda said, what we try to do in this book, although we're both supporters of the UBI, I, I myself count myself as a kind of you know, cautious supporter of the UBI. We're we're trying our best here to present as objectively as we can both sides of the argument, the best arguments we can think of uh, for the UBI, and the best arguments and, and evidence we can think of against it, and uh, and allow readers to make up their own mind. Yeah, I, I'll tell the I'll, I'll tell the listeners. Originally, we couldn't get both of you guys together, so we had to reschedule. I'm really glad we have both of you because it's nice to have a slight difference of, of approach, which it appears that you do. And it's funny, you know, I, to begin with, I always go to Amazon because I like to look at the little summary they have and follow the author. So I go there and I just type universal basic income. And then I look and there's like 20 books called universal basic income. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, why did I never really give this a lot of thought? So I guess we talked about it a little bit before we began the interview, but okay, so you've just explained universal basic income. But once you say it, what and like what you were saying about people's response so many thoughts just automatically pop into your mind at least into mine especially when you were talking Miranda about okay uh, Jeff Bezos Elon Musk uh, Bill Gates they're all going to get this and you know you think okay Melinda she's going to get the thousand a month she's going to give it away uh, Jeff Bezos is going to get the thousand a month put it into a start up and make 10 times that money in the first year and then get negative tax thousand dollars so those are some of the issues that i think about and then of course there are lots more that pop into mind so why don't we go through the pros and cons and especially matt since you seem to be the one that cautiously approaches it yeah yeah so um so the basic idea of, of a UBI, um, as, as we've talked about a little bit before, is, is simple cash transfers, unrestricted cash transfers that people can spend in any way they want. They don't have to spend it on food. They don't have to spend it on rent. Uh, they don't have to spend it on medical care. They could do all those things. They could also buy groceries. They could also uh, pay their medical bills, pay an overdue cell phone bill. They could put it in the bank and uh, save it for next month or next year if they wanted to. Uh, so these cash transfers are unrestricted. The cash transfers are not tied to work in any way. So we don't just give them to people who are working like some social welfare programs currently in existence do, the earned income tax credit being the most prominent of those. Uh, we don't require people to be trying to work, right? So uh, some welfare programs will say like, look, we'll help you out if you're trying to get a job, but you're just struggling somehow. But if you can show evidence that you're out there doing interviews and things, then you're eligible. Universal basic income, none of that. Uh, there's no, no attempt to force people into the labor market. Um, for some people, that's a major stumbling block uh, to supporting a UBI. So some people think that the purpose of a welfare state should be to help people who cannot help themselves. Uh, and so if you can help yourself, but you're simply choosing not to, right, you could be out working and supporting yourself through earned income, but you're lazy or you just don't feel like it, right, uh, then it's not our job as a society to support you. Um, and so a UBI on this view that hands out cash indiscriminately, as it were, um, seems to some people both um, economically worrisome insofar as uh, it's providing, 
there's no incentive there to work. There's no economic incentive to shift people into the labor market. And so some people worry that this is going to have negative consequences sort of downstream in terms of economic productivity. And then some people just have a more gut moral objection to this idea yeah. of, of helping people who aren't willing to do the work themselves. That there's something unfair or unjust about pe some people who are working being taxed to support other people who could work but choose not to. Um, so that's a that's a very polarizing issue for a lot of people in support of UPI. Well, what about, well, I mean, obviously, if you can listen to a Republican debate, uh, it, no one's even going to support the concept of welfare in any sh shape or form. But what about the idea that's going to be promulgated by right-wing people and maybe just logical people that when you give the $1,000, it's going to be used for gambling or drugs or lottery tickets and um, and you cite studies, but you have a very small population in the world that actually is entitled to some type of monthly stipend, if you will, whether it's um, Native Americans or in Canada, or even, I guess, it's, was it Iran? Not, was it Iran that was a surprising one? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so you have little, those studies, again, people are going to say, oh, from your ivory towers, you have these studies, and they're going to say, but it's never been done in America, so how can you say that people aren't going to just, you know, buy fancy TVs. Like I said, they're going to buy lottery tickets because they say, okay, with this $1,000 a month, there's the possibility that I'm going to make 30, 38 million or even more. So, so if, if I could jump in here and take that yeah. question, I want to first push back on your question. So I, I think that you're absolutely correct that if you listen to a Republican debate, probably the, the majority or the tenor of what you would get would be that we shouldn't have welfare. But I'd like to point out that one of the more popular UBI books and proposals to come out in the past 10 or so years um, was by Charles Murray, who suggested sort of doing away with our current welfare state and implementing a UBI. And one of the precursors to a UBI was this idea of a negative income tax, which was popularized by libertarian economist Milton Friedman. So this ties back into something Matt said a few minutes ago when we were talking about the polarization. One thing that I think is interesting about a UBI is that you get some conservatives and libertarians supporting it, actually. Um, and we can go into those reasons a little bit later. And you also get some progressives opposing it. So people have very strong opinions, and those opinions often map on to political lines, but they don't always and they don't thoroughly map on to political lines. So I, I just wanted to poke back at your question some. Um, sure. But the, the, the bigger question, which is won't people just waste it, um, the, the answer is most evidence suggests that most people won't waste it. And you're absolutely correct that a UBI as such has only been tried in very few programs. But here in the United States, we have a lot of evidence of what people do with other unrestricted cash programs, such as the earned income tax credit or the child tax credit. And food stamps, even though they can only be used for food, are fairly cash-like because um, people can spend them on almost, but not quite, whatever they want in the grocery store. And sometimes people find ways to convert their food stamps into cash. And so we do have a lot of evidence that that cash and cash-like transfers in the U.S. Um, lead to good outcomes. So they lead to increased years of schooling, um, higher birth weights, um, lower uh, lower infant mortality, higher test scores for kids. Um, lower rates of incarceration for young adults, higher rates of employment for young adults that got these benefits when they were kids, um, increased nutrition, more spending on fruits and vegetables and meats. And a, a recent World Bank study of, of 19, um, an overview of 19 programs suggested that people don't, in fact, um, tend to spend waste cash transfers like UBI on alcohol and gambling and drugs. Now, some people will, some people do that under the current system, but there's no evidence to suggest that there's just gonna be widespread drugs and gamblings having from this. And all the evidence we have both in developing countries and from similar analogous programs here suggests that most of the time, most families make good use of this cash. So, so Matt, you know, one of the things again, as a bookseller is, um, you know, a lot of people might look at this book as being, oh, this is gonna be opaque or inaccessible. One of the things you did, it was really good. It was you, your chapters are really short. 
but they are succinct and comprehensive, even though they're only a few pages. But you devote a couple of them, and if you guys are both libertarians, to the idea of eliminating the, the concept of implementing the UBI by eliminating Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, welfare, food stamps. But what's that do? Because you're just taking away so much, which is good for libertarians because government's no longer involved. But then you're putting in place this massive three trillion dollar program. So what's the idea is to take this portmanteau and just collapse it and you just have one thing? Is that the idea? Well, I, there are a lot of ideas, uh, right? So <clears throat> the question of what kind of basic income we should have and how we should pay for it. Um, these are sort of two separate questions, but they're they're highly interrelated, right? So what kind of basic income should we have? How large should it be? How much money should we be giving people? Uh, to how many people should we be giving that money? Should we go to adults only, or should it be a grant included for children as well? Um, you know, the more people you include under the basic income, obviously, the higher the cost of that program becomes. Uh, and then you face this challenge of, well, how are we going to pay for all of this? Because if you just as you might be inclined to do, multiply the population of the United States by the size of the basic income, you wind up with a very, very large number um, that looks uh, intimidatingly difficult to pay for. So one suggestion for how to pay for it would be to uh, sort of take funds that are currently being used for other social welfare programs and repurpose those to um, a basic income. So in some cases, that might be relatively easy, right? So food stamps, for instance, is a relatively small program. Uh, it's very close to a cash grant already, as Miranda noted. Uh, so simply converting that into a completely unrestricted cash grant wouldn't be a huge political leap. Um, other programs like Social Security are, uh, as you might imagine, much more difficult right? Uh, it's a much larger program in terms of total expenditures, uh, and it has a very, very strong uh, interest group supporting it, uh, such that if you proposed uh, eliminating it and replacing it with a universal basic income, uh, you would probably find yourself uh, out of office very, very quickly in the United States. So, um, you know, we don't necessarily advocate, uh, you know, one of those approaches over the others. We're sort of simply mapping out the possibilities. But for anybody who takes the idea of a basic income seriously, there's a fundamental challenge that you have to grapple with, which is, um, on the one hand, you want a basic income that is large enough to make a substantial difference in people's lives. So if you're just giving people $10 a month, right, that's not going to do anything. Uh, if you're giving people $1,000 a month, that's much more impressive in terms of what it can do for them. But of course, now it's a much more expensive program. Uh, so you want to balance both the meaningfulness of the program, which means a larger grant, with keeping the cost of the program controllable, which means either a smaller grant or a more restricted population receiving that grant. So in the book, we try to map out a variety of different options for striking that balance, but different people will uh, strike that balance in different ways. And there are a variety of different UBI proposals out there by people like Yang or uh, labor leader Andrew Stern um, or some of the other countries that are experimenting with basic income. There's experiments going on in uh, England right now and Canada, uh, all of which are taking slightly different approaches to the basic concept of unrestricted cash transfers. Yeah, and I would I would say that here, a lot of times people's normative priors will shape what kind of UBI they support. So if you support a UBI because you think that we're not doing enough to help the poor right now, then you would probably want what, what we refer to as the UBI plus approach, where UBI is layered on top of existing welfare programs to sort of fill the gap. Um, those people are probably gonna fall more onto the progressive end of the spe spectrum. The libertarians and conservatives who support a UBI um, some of them probably think inherently we should do some redistribution and maybe the amount we're doing right now is the right amount. It's just not done really well because our current system is expensive, inefficient, paternalistic, and so on. And so this is where you get people like Milton Friedman suggesting we replace it with the negative income tax. Actually, um, and more recently, Charles Murray suggesting we replace the current welfare system with his plan. Um, uh, 
so th those types of people are, are going to want more of a replacement. And then, of course, there's a question like Matt alluded to of what do you replace? Some things are easy. Some things are more difficult. You know, it's like it's hard not to do a scattershot approach to this because I like there's so many things that came out in my head. But the one thing you mentioned, Matt, was, OK, does it go to everybody? And then I thought as a lawyer practicing longer than two of you have been teaching and practicing law together, um, I was thinking, OK, you're going to give this to every kid, every infant the day they're born. Are you going to establish trust for them? The money's not going to go into their pocket. Is it going to go uniform gift to minors? It's not a gift, is it? You know, those kinds of things. Just It's the nuts and bolts of it and dotting the I's. I mean, how could you even begin to accomplish that? What would be the mechanism? And you, Miranda, you know, as a tax attorney, I guess, how, how would you go about? Just you just to give it to their parents. Just like families with kids get bigger SNAP benefits, the EITC largely goes to families with kids. You, the child tax credit, by definition, you just give it to their parents. Yeah, it sounds like it. When some kid gets to be 18 years old, he sues his parents because they spent all of their, the money he was supposed to get on whatever. I mean, yeah, that's again, that, that's another common fear is that parents are just going to waste uh, money that was meant for their kids. But again, the evidence doesn't suggest this. So for example, in um, we have some recent evidence in 2021, the child tax credit was expanded and paid monthly. Um, unfortunately, that, that expansion wasn't made permanent, but over 90% of the low-income families that received the expanded child tax credit used that money to pay for basic necessities like food, clothing, car repairs, gas, or on school-related expenditures like books, calculators, computers, children's clothes. And again, from some of the evidence I suggested earlier, all of the positive outcomes we see when it comes to kids' test scores and lower disciplinary incidents in schools and so on, most of it suggests that when parents get cash to help their families, that they use it in ways that benefits their kids. Now, some kids are going to fall through the cracks. That's already happening. The current system that we have has so many hoops and hurdles um, and rules that preclude, for example, drug felons often from participating. That right now, the kids who are most likely to suffer from parents not using the funds wisely, they're not getting anything at all right now. So I, I think Matt and I have a sense that if you give these families money, maybe the parents will waste a little bit of it, but they're probably not going to waste all of it. And it's, it's better to help these kids a little bit than not at all. Or at least that's my sense. I don't know if Matt agrees with that. Yeah, I mean, but I think- What you raise think, is, a, is a very common objection. I think all, all of us, uh, even people who view themselves as, as fairly progressive, sometimes at least- suffer from a, a tendency to moralize poverty uh, in the sense that we sort of assume, even if just implicitly, that uh, if somebody is poor, it, it, it's probably because they're making some bad choices, they're suffering from some character defects. Uh, and so if we give them money uh, to spend on food, they're going to spend it on alcohol instead. Or if we give them food money to spend on their kids, they're going to spend it on themselves instead. Uh, we wouldn't do that, of course. Like, I wouldn't do that. Miranda, you wouldn't do that. I'm sure, Sam, you wouldn't do that. Uh, but it's it's those people, right, uh, that we have to worry about. Um, and, I mean, there's, there's some truth to that, right? There are going to be some people who do abuse freedom. Anytime you give people choice uh, over how to spend their money, uh, some people are going to use uh, those choices badly, but I think most people are like most people, right? And I think most people uh, are going to prioritize buying groceries over buying alcohol. They're going to prioritize, uh, most parents are going to prioritize their their children's needs um, over their own most of the time. Uh, and so the basic income involves, it involves a bit of trust. It involves a bit of um, allowing people to to run their own lives, to run their own family. And taking a step back and saying like, we, you know, we're not going to micromanage you and make sure that you're doing things just the way we think you should be doing it. Okay. Well, at the risk of being canceled, I would ask this question because I thought, okay, let me look at this. Because you mentioned morality and I'm not talking about demographics, but if you look at what looters steal when looters loot, they steal laptops, smartphones, jewelry, 
they steal high end. Because they can sell that and convert it to cash. No, I think they like it. It's why there's a long line for Louis Vuitton at every mall in America. They they steal cash, they steal alcohol and tobacco products, and they take firearms and ammunition. I'm not saying, I'm not even suggesting that that would happen. It's just that it was a thought that came into my mind. I looked it up. I'm, I don't I don't think I use chat GPT. I think I actually went to yeah. Wikipedia, which is hard to do now. But um, yeah, so... I guess I'm reiterating an argument that you already rebutted, but this idea of morality and poverty, which also goes to your work on dynastic wealth, Miranda, and paternalism, as you're talking about. So I asked my brother, you know, why is everything so divided? And he goes, because half the people in America think one thing and half the people in America think the other thing. So that was my my most important question. I, here is this how I go on, Matt, and talk. Um, but my most important question when I read the book was, do you guys think this this could ever happen? Do you think there's a possibility that this could ever really happen? So if you'd asked me when I first started writing about the basic income, which was back in 2011, I believe, uh, I would have said definitely not, or not not in my lifetime, um, not anytime soon. Um, now I'm not so sure. Uh, now, since 2011, there's been this a tremendous explosion of interest in the basic income, uh, not just in the United States, but but worldwide. Um, there are more than 50 pilot programs currently being run on the basic income just in the United States alone, mostly at the municipal level. So there are a variety of cities from Philadelphia to Los Angeles to Chicago that are all running relatively small scale experiments with the UBI, um, almost all of which has been privately funded through philanthropic, philanthropic aid. There's an organization called Mayors, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, uh, which has sponsored a lot of these programs. Um, which has received uh, a lot of help and support from uh, from Chris Hughes, uh, former Facebook founder, uh, and a number of other individuals and organizations. Um, there are uh, international efforts at uh, using a basic income as a form of development aid. Uh, the organization uh, Give Well, uh, or Give Directly rather, um, has been supporting a, a 10 year long basic income pilot program in uh, rural Kenya. Um, which is nice because, you know, in a situation like Kenya, a dollar goes much farther than it does in, say, Chicago, right? So, you know, I mentioned this paradox of basic income, which is how do you provide enough money to make a meaningful difference in people's lives and still keep the cost of the program affordable? Well, one way of doing that is, you know, try to help people outside the United States where cost of living uh, is, is much, much lower and people are suffering from, from real desperate life-threatening poverty. So we'll have some really interesting data coming in from that about how uh, a basic income might work um, in that kind of very different uh, socioeconomic context. Um, so just all of this is happening at once. Uh, and um, you know, I think there are still some formidable challenges to overcome uh, before we see a basic income program implemented uh, on a, in a large geographical scale uh, and on a permanent basis, all of these experiments I've mentioned are short term. They're one or two years for the most part. The Kenya thing as a, a bit of an outlier at 10 years, but nothing is permanent so far. Uh, so to see something like, you know, the state of California even implementing a permanent UBI, uh, that would surprise me if it happened in the next 10 years, but it, it wouldn't it wouldn't completely shock me. Uh, and I and I certainly wouldn't be shocked if I saw something like that. Uh, happen in my lifetime. Uh, I think um, there's there's a lot of interest in the idea. There's mounting evidence uh, from not from other places that have instantiated a permanent UBI because we haven't seen that yet, but from other cash transfer programs about what happens when you give people cash and then just let them do what they want with it. Uh, that evidence tends to be fairly uniformly positive, whether you're looking at uh, what they spend the money on, how this affects long-term health and educational outcomes, how this affects labor market participation, um, all of those outcomes tend to be surprisingly uh, positive. There was a, a program in Stockton a few years ago, uh, a very um, widely publicized experiment with the basic income called the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration, which found that 
uh, the, the, um, the group that received the basic income relative to the control group, uh, which they looked at, which didn't receive any grant at all, actually had higher labor market participation. Uh, so you gave people money, you said, you know, you don't have to do anything for this. Um, here's your money, enjoy it. Uh, and those people actually worked more than people who didn't receive anything, which surprised a lot of observers. But I think when you think about it, it actually makes a bit of sense. Um, so so I've, I'm cautiously optimistic about the prospects for basic income. Cautiously, though, uh, there, there are a lot of political obstacles to be overcome. Uh, and I think the kind of basic income that we see might not be the fully universal uh, form of, of cash grant that, that Miranda and I spent a lot of time talking about in the book. Uh, uh, my suspicion now is that something somewhat, mo somewhat more narrowly targeted, um, you know, like for instance, a grant that only goes to parents with children um, living at home um, might be more likely than, than a fully universal grant in the future. Yes, and if, if I can piggyback on that, I feel like, you know, when you're talking to your kids about accomplishing a goal, you always say to aim high. And then if you don't quite get there, you still have made a lot of progress. I feel like, you know, hoping for a full UBI, if, if the worst thing that happens is that we end up with a universal child benefit of the type that Matt just met, that mentioned, I'd be very happy with that. I'd rather have a full UBI, but I'd be delighted if we could have some kind of universal child benefit of the kind that a number of European countries have. Um, and if I could also, right at the end of Matt's um, statements, he talked about work and freeloading, and this circles back to something that you brought up right at the beginning of our interview. Um, you know, Matt mentioned that a lot of people have, a, a, or maybe you mentioned that a lot of people have sort of a, a moral idea that people need to work, and then Matt mentioned the results of the Stockton interview. So I think that the one thing that gets overlooked in the debate about work is, is that it costs money to make money. So you need money to buy gas. You need money to pay for work clothes. You need money to fix cars. And some evidence came out of the um, those COVID relief payments that we all got that a lot of people used, I forget what percentage, but a, a, you know, a, not, a not insignificant percentage of people use some of that money to help them find new jobs. Um, and another thing that often gets lost in the debate is we tend to think about a UBI comparing it to a world where there's no redistribution and no help at all. When the reality is we're comparing the UBI to a world where we have this existing patchwork of programs and the way that the current programs are structured, there are a lot of disincentives to work. First, it takes a lot of time and effort to fill out all the applications and go to agencies. And if your income fluctuates, then your aid, you know, your SNAP benefits are going to fluctuate, your other aid benefits are going to fluctuate. So it, it's not crazy for someone to look at all that and say, well, gosh, you know, given the uncertainty and the what a pain in the butt it is, um, you know, to try to to try to get some of these benefits if I'm working, I'd rather just, you know, not waste time both trying to work and filling out all these applications. I'm just going to fill out all of these applications. Um, also, a lot of the current benefits phase out really steeply, which means the more money you make, the less benefits you have. Um, it kind of acts like an implicit tax, and there are ways to design a UBI so that it phases out less steeply, which means that you get to keep more of each dollar that you earn. So um, uh, that doesn't necessarily go right to your question about the, the political prospects of it, but uh, it touches on something that's related to the political prospects that I know for a, a lot of people, what creates the opposition is this idea of work. Yeah, it's funny. Um, again, um, just because my life is surrounded by books, uh, whether it's a fiction, whether it's a novel, uh, whether it's nonfiction or something about qubits and quantum mechanics, it's really nice when the reader, after he closes the book, is going to, like like I have, is just think of all these questions and start pondering on their own. I think that's another, if, if we did call it a primer at the beginning, it gives you enough of a foundational basis um, that you can think about these things yourself and actually perhaps work towards them. But uh, another bottom line question, again, literally, is who's going to pay for this? Especially if you, Miranda, are on the progressive side of this, like something plus rather than a minus. Okay, where's the money come from? We don't have any money now. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, who pays depends in part on how big it is. So if all you want to do is replace existing programs, then the people that are paying yeah. at, are really just, no one's going to pay any extra taxes. It's just that we're going to reshuffle our current aid dollar. So that's what Charles Murray would have you do. You know, the three of us wouldn't see our taxes go up. It's just that some welfare benef current welfare beneficiaries would get a little bit less and some welfare beneficiaries would get a little bit more. If you did something like what I've proposed um, in other work, which is a $500 a month UBI, you'd have to raise some taxes elsewhere. And um, there are a variety of options for doing that. Andrew Yang and Andrew Stern both proposed a 5 to 10% VAT, which a lot of European countries have. It's very similar to a sales tax um, for your listeners that, that aren't familiar with VATs. My co-author, Daniel Hemmel of NYU, and I proposed a, probably a 7% surtax. Um, but you know, people at the higher end, if you're going to do something like $500 a month for everyone, including kids, would see their taxes go up. And you know, whether or not you think that's worth it, that's going to come down to your normative priors. I happen to think it's worth it. Um, other people don't. The Columbia University just um, did an analysis of the expanded child ta child tax credit. And they suggested that every dollar put into the child tax credit returned $8 of benefits. So I think that's pretty good bang for your buck. I'm willing to pay a little bit more in taxes for that. But I recognize that not everyone's going to agree with that. Um, and the extent to which you have to raise taxes also depends on what current programs you cut. If you cut social, social security, that's you know, billions of dollars you could put into a UBI. If you say, well, seniors are going to keep getting their social security and get a UBI, that makes it substantially more expensive. Right. One other factor to keep in mind in, in thinking about the question of how we're going to pay for this is you know, clearly that, that question is related to the question of how much we have to pay for, how much the program itself is going to cost. Um, and you know, the name of the program, Universal Basic Income, sort of suggests this idea that everybody's going to get it. And so, you know, we just multiply, you know, the cost, the size of the grant by the size of the U.S. population. Um, but that's that's misleading. Uh, and if you look at the concrete proposals that uh, advocates of the UBI have made, what you find is that all of them sort of fudge that universality in, in one of two ways, right? And there's basically just two different approaches you can take. You can either um, do what's called means testing on the front end, right? So you you look to see who needs the money and you give it only to people who need it and not to people who don't need it. So if your income falls below a certain threshold, you get a grant. Uh, if it's above that threshold, you don't. That's how the negative income tax that Milton Friedman proposed would have worked. Um, but if you're not going to do that, if you're going to give a check to everybody, uh, you're not going to do means testing on the front end, you're going to do means testing on the back end uh, instead, which means that you give the check to everybody. But come April 15th, right, uh, when tax time is due, the people whose income falls above a certain threshold are going to pay most or all of that grant back in taxes. So their net benefit is going to be zero. Uh, or so even once, negative. Jeff Bezos right. is going to get a check for six or $12,000, but his taxes right. are going to go up for more than six or $12,000. So where exactly. the break even point is, it's going to depend on the increased tax rate and also how big the UBI is. So, and there are, there are both the, administrative pros and cons to each of those approaches and political pros and cons to each of those approaches. So like Matt said, our current programs means test on the front end. And that probably seems attractive to a lot of people, though they're pros to the universality. But means testing on the front end requires a lot more administrative information and it's much more difficult to do. Um, and a lot of times there's a mismatch. So for example, the COVID relief payments that we all got were supposedly means tested on the front end, but you were getting a check from the government in 2020 and it was based on your 2018 or your 2019 income. So there was a real big mismatch. People that had just recently lost their jobs didn't get anything. So if you wanna accurately match up a, a means tested program at the front end, you need people to be giving information about their income every month or every few months and and that um that that's very difficult so means testing on the back end just giving everyone a check and then taxing it back later is much more administratively difficult now 
On the one hand, some universal programs like Social Security are politically popular, Social Security and Medicare. On the other hand, it does open you up to the wire, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk getting a check because it is, it's hard for people, you know, without sitting down and doing the numbers to understand they're getting a check, but they're paying it back and then some. Yeah, it's funny. Um, sometimes I get confused with you guys because if you're libertarians, what you're saying just convolutes the tax code a little bit more than it already is. Be that as it may, I may be wrong about that. Well, not, not necessarily. If you just added a few percentage points to everyone's rate, that doesn't make anything more complicated than it is now. Yeah, but I would rather have one page, 10% of your income, unless you have income less than this, and that would be the end of the yeah. IRS, especially since they had one person working on Donald Trump for 20 years. Okay, this is where I go off, Matt. This is where I do this. <laughs> um, but okay, so if I was writing a book, okay, how do we get money in the federal government? I would go, okay, here's what we do. We, uh, we tax gasoline. So whatever gasoline's at, we have a flat tax on gasoline. We tax cigarettes more. First of all, that gets rid of cigarettes, so we don't have as much health care. Um, we tax marijuana. We tax gambling. We tax legal prostitution. We tax alcohol. We tax luxury cars. And we give speeding tickets. That'll be $60 to... Uh, someone who works for me and six hundred thousand dollars for Elon Musk, and and have a national lottery, and then we'd have lots of money. Those are good ideas, I think, but none of them will ever occur. I'm sorry, I, this is so off topic, and it's also Swifty and like a modest proposal. No, I mean it's it brainstorming those those kinds of funny proposals is is I think. It's a, it's a helpful exercise to go through in terms of just realizing, look, U.S. tax rates are are still relatively low by global standards. Yeah. Um, so there are a variety of ways that we could come up with more money for federal programs if we needed to. Uh, one of those ways would just be a straight increase in the income tax. But there are a lot of other options out there. Uh, and it's worth considering some of those options because some of those might be superior, like a carbon tax, for instance. Um, I right. think would be a much better mechanism for raising income than an income tax, because when you tax something, you get less of it. Uh, and it'd be better to get less carbon emissions than it would be to get less labor, um, right? Labor is useful. Carbon emissions are harmful. So let's tax the thing that we want to get less of rather than the thing we want to get more of. It's funny how people's perspective changes. Remember like in 1966, when England was 95% and the Beatles moved to Switzerland, so they didn't have to pay even the song by George Harrison, Tax Man, yeah, you know, yeah. paying 95 percent on every dollar that they made above a certain amount. But it's it's funny you say that because right now the perspective. Well, look look at inflation, the numbers that came out today. You know that doesn't seem that bad. It's just that someone set a goal of two percent and it's three percent instead, and the Fed's still going to hike. But yeah, you got to have to deal with that too. It's floating perceptions. I think you mentioned that a little bit, Miranda, about this. It, it, there's a, a big psychological aspect to all of this. Yeah, and I think the, the way, there are a lot of different ways to get cash to people. Yeah. And mathematically, they all end up doing the same thing, but psychologically, they appear different to people. So for example, if you call something a tax credit, types of programs that are run through the tax code tend to be more popular, like the EITC and the child tax credit than just giving people cash. So, you know, perhaps one way of doing this is to give everyone some type of universal tax credit. Of course, that has some downsides. If it's a tax credit run through the tax system, then everyone has to file ta a tax form to get their universal credit, and that can be complicated. That's one of the problems with the EITC. Um, but thinking about the psychology, I, I think, can help us pick the, the most politically palatable frame. Not a lot of people know about this, and I wish I wish more advocates of a basic income did. But um, you know, we, we talk about this in the book. You know, the closest the world ever came to seeing something like a basic income implemented on a permanent and large scale uh, was in the United States in 1969. Uh, under the presidency of Richard Nixon, um, which shocks a lot of people uh, that that you know a Republican president would be the one pushing for a basic income program, but but he did. Uh, there was a program called the Family Assistance Plan uh, that came reasonably close to passing uh, as law that would have provided cash grants not to everybody but to to parents with dependent children. Um, 
on on a permanent no strings attached basis. Uh, was and there I a think, work requirement to that? Uh, th there was a kind of work requirement to okay. that as well, right? So it was both limited to parents um, and and sort of limited uh, in terms of requiring work. So basically, if you didn't work as parents, you would have lost your share of the benefit, but the children still would have gotten their benefits. Okay. Your benefit okay. would have been reduced, but not completely okay. eliminated. Um, and I think looking at that program and um, why it had the modest success that it did and why it fell short of crossing the finish line um, is, I think, very instructive in um, helping us to get a better sense of what the prospects are for a basic income occurring in the future, what would have to happen, what that basic income would have to look like in order for it to be feasible. I think, you know, tying it to parents was <clears throat> was a big part of what made that program attractive. Um, because look, if you think, right, if you think like, look, poor people ought to be supporting themselves, the federal government shouldn't be in the business of supporting them. That works as an argument, okay, if you're talking about adults. <laughs> right. But if you're talking about kids, like, you can't really make that argument, right? Like kids, kids who are born into poor families didn't do anything to deserve that situation. It's not their fault. And there's nothing they can really do about that. So if we're going to punish them because of the sins of their fathers, uh, that that seems unjust and inhumane um, to a lot of people, right? And so, so a program that's focused on helping parents with children, I think has a lot more political appeal than a fully universal program that's uh, designed to help everybody, um, but uh, but why didn't it go through? Why didn't why didn't it succeed? Um, there are a lot of reasons. It's a complicated and fascinating story. Daniel Moynihan, who was very much involved in the um, in the design and promulgation of that program, as as one of Nixon's advisors, wrote a really interesting book about it. Um, but uh, there were a lot of interest groups that were threatened by the universal program, a lot of interest groups that were tied to the existing welfare system uh, that opposed radical changes in it. Um, and it was, at the end of the day, just really hard to make the numbers work. Um, so, you know, Moynihan and Nixon were both drawing very heavily on Milton Friedman's ideas and the proposal for a negative income tax, which was extremely popular in the 1960s. Um, but it as the program went on and as it morphed in response to political pressures from this or that interest group, Milton Friedman at one point said, like, look, you know, I, I like the idea of a negative income tax, but this thing has been so bastardized that I no longer want my name associated with it in any way. Um, it's it's going to make a lot of people worse off um, because uh, you're sort of piling this you're piling this program on top of all these other existing welfare programs and a side effect of doing that is that you're creating these, uh, Miranda referenced this idea earlier, these cliffs where if a family works like another 10 hours or earns another couple hundred dollars, they're going to lose like $5,000 worth of benefits. Uh, and nobody in their right mind is going to work those extra 10 hours if it means they're going to be worse off as a result. So you don't, you don't want to design a program that's going to punish people for trying to help themselves, um, at least not at that kind of excessive level. So that ultimately, you just couldn't, you couldn't make the numbers work in a way that was going to make sense. Uh, and you couldn't find a way of reconciling all the competing interest groups. Those were ultimately the challenges that sunk Nixon's plan. And those, I think, are still the fundamental challenges that any uh, basic income program faces today. Well, as we wind down, and that's a really good segue to it, question kind of has to be asked in a bubble because of 2024 coming up and who knows what's going to happen. But suppose someone reads your book and because, you know, not to compliment you guys, but again, but, you know, it's a good book. So when they read it, if they come away and they go, you know what, this is a great idea. I'd like to see it happen. Well, they're not going to take placards down and demonstrate in front of the Supreme Court or Congress, and there's no one really to give money to to promulgate this idea. So, okay, I come away and I go, you know what, this makes perfect sense. I think it's a great idea. So are you telling anybody, suggesting to anybody what it is that they could, both of you, what it is that they could do to make this dream come to pass? What would it be? That's a good well, one. We are not advocates ourselves, but I think one thing we mentioned at the end of our book are a number of organizations that people can right. get involved with. Um, people who are advocates and have experience advocating on behalf of lower income families um, who are a natural fit for this, 
Um, like uh, Matt mentioned, GiveWell. There's also, Matt, do you remember the name of Scott Santens's organization? There are numerous organizations. Um, I just don't have them at the top of my head, but if you buy our book and look at the last couple of pages, we talk about where people can give more information. Certainly if Andrew Yang runs for president, again, I, I think it will come out. Um, I mean, you're, one thing is tricky is that as Matt alluded to, there are numerous probably industry groups and lobbyist groups that are opposed to this. Like, for example, just the idea of taking away SNAP and WIC grocery stores and a lot of food producers. Um, WIC is a program for women, infants, and children aged five and under. And there are like really arcane rules about what you can buy with your WIC benefits. Um, you can buy white eggs, but not brown, and blocks of cheese, but not shredded cheese. Um, and uh, for some items like yogurt, they even say which brands of yogurt you can buy with your WIC benefits. So, you know, someone that has lobbied to get themselves included on this WIC list of, of approved purchases, they're not going to be happy with people just getting cash. Um, a lot of the retailers that accept SNAP also like the fact that benefits have to be spent at grocery stores and, and can't be spent, you know, buying other things that a family might need. Um, and, you know, one, one, problem with any piece of legislation is when you have dispersed beneficiaries and, and this would be, you know, a very dispersed set of beneficiaries that it's often harder for dispersed beneficiaries to sort of overcome centralized, more discrete opponents of a change. So um, you'd, we, you'd really have to channel it into the already existing organizations that advocate on behalf of poor and low-income families. And luckily, there are a number of those, some of whom are advocating for UBI, some of whom are advocating for the child tax credit um, and, and uh, other programs. And recently, a lot of the action has been at the relatively local level, right? So Yang's campaign was trying to implement a basic income um, federally for the whole United States. But uh, since then... Uh, most of what we've seen have been uh, pressure for and experiments in the basic income uh, in cities uh, and sometime at the level of states. So California is, I think, the first state to pass a kind of statewide basic income experiment program, though it's, it sort of devolves it down to uh, different cities. Um, so th that that opens up a lot more opportunities, I think, for individual participation in, in advocacy and um, direct involvement if they want to be involved in these programs. It's a lot easier to get something done uh, at the city level uh, than it is at the state or, or federal level. So, you know, one one advantage of our federalized system of political organization is we have we have the opportunity to try things out on a small scale. Uh, and there are a lot of, as I said, a lot of different things being tried out right now. There are programs that are targeting, um, you know, young adults exiting the foster care system. There are programs targeting pregnant women. There are programs targeting artists in San Francisco. Um, so, uh, you know, my, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is this is wonderful. We're letting you know, we're letting a thousand flowers boom here, and we'll see which one of them work and which one of them don't. Um, and uh, hopefully we can learn enough from that to uh, to build the knowledge base um, and the, um, the sort of organizational infrastructure that would be necessary if we want to scale things up to a larger level. Yeah, and, and I, I, I just pulled up a list of some of the advocacy groups whose names escaped both Matt and I earlier. Um, some of the, I think, more active advocacy groups um, are the Economic Security Project, Humanity Forward, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, which Matt mentioned before, Give Directly, which Matt mentioned before. And then something that's sort of a mix of an advocacy group and a research group and a think tank is the Basic Income Earth Network. Um, and so people can just, you know, go, if they're interested in getting involved, Google these various groups who are um, pushing for ways to implement this. That's a great way to end it because it answers my question perfectly. And that's one of the reasons why I really enjoyed the, uh, the last part of the book. But I will say this, if we do uh, have this as a book club book, I want to zoom you guys in so you can take the heat instead of me as moderator. <laughs> it's a That'd deal. Be We'd be delighted yeah. to. Okay. Well, thanks again so much. I really enjoyed talking to both of you. Thanks, Sam. This is fun. Yeah. Thank you. We enjoyed it too. Thanks.